Hi, let's talk a little bit about ecology in general, what it is, what areas it co covers, and give you a sense of a, a sort of a sense of uh, uh, the issues we'll be discussing in the class. Okay? Um, I guess we can start with the term itself. That's a typical way to do things. Uh, this guy, Ernst Haeckel, who was a German zoologist, is actually the guy who coined the term, and um, it's built the term ecology, let's see if I can find a better picture of Ernst. Uh, oh, I know what I wanted to do. Let's just look at images. Um, so Haeckel uh, recognized the need for a scientific discipline that addressed um, how organisms interact with everything around them. He, uh, the, the word ecology comes from a Greek word oikos, which I guess means house. And I think um, from what I read, Haeckel talked about ecology being the study of how an organism inter interacts with the organic and inorganic environment. What we actually say today is that um, it's how an individual, an individual organism interacts with both the biotic and abiotic environment. In other words, every, everything around it. Typically, we divide that between the physical world and a biological world. And this business of um, distinguishing by, between what are called biotic and abiotic factors um, lets us look at things that um, have a profound influence on life like, uh, oh, temperature or nutrients, um, atmospheric concentration of various gases like um, carbon dioxide or oxygen, um, the impact of different um, uh, factors such as physical factors like um, the tides or wind, um, and of course the importance of water. So all those things are part of the, the physical side that organisms interact with. I think probably we spend the most time in ecology talking about water and um, uh, temperature, but, but certainly the whole range of things matters. Um, and then uh, on the biotic side, which probably has gotten the most in interest, we look at everything from how members of a species interact with one another, or maybe I should mean members of a population, but also then how if different species interact. And uh, one of the things I thought was cool about Haeckel is besides being a zoologist, he um, illustrated, and that's most of what you see here are some of Haeckel's illustrations. There's a, he wrote a book, uh, Art Forms in Nature. Uh, I've actually copied, got a copy of that book for you. I think the copy I found is in the original German, but no worries, because mostly you're going to do what I do, I assume, and look at the pretty pictures. So uh, let's take a look at one of these. The thing, the thing I like about this relative to the conversation we're having right now is that um, Hegel, Hegel's um, Art Forms in Nature focuses on all types of organisms. And you can see both an array of in, individual organisms, as in this picture of, um, what are they, I suppose, anemones? Oh, those, I see there's a crab, and is that a starfish maybe? But also communities, groupings of organisms. Uh, to talk about that a little bit, or at least to illustrate it a little bit, um, I dug through my old slides. Uh, Phyllis and I took a trip. Phyllis is my wife, uh, my college girlfriend. So Phyllis and I took a trip in 1980, which was about a year before we got married. And we went, we were visiting her brother in Seattle, and we went to the Olympic Peninsula. And I suppose if I'd been on my game, I would have uh, already had up a picture of the Olympic Peninsula, but what the heck? Let's take a look. Uh, yeah, here we go. So this is it. So that's the Olympic Peninsula. So Seattle's here, Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and just to give you more context, I guess, that's what I'm talking about, this, this piece. It's uh, an incredibly cool place. Most of it, as you can see, is a national park, thanks, good, thank goodness. And I should point out the park is not merely here in the center of the peninsula, but it also runs uh, along here near some uh, remaining Indian uh, some Indian reservations. And um, it has a distinction that we'll talk about of having multiple biomes, multiple different types of um, 
not just habitats, but combinations of, of temperature, land mass, and so forth that allows for different types of um, ecosystems, different types of groups of organisms. And so it has everything from the center of the park with high mountains that have um, alpine uh, habitat to um, what's called a moraine, a high, a high um, uh, forested moraine area. It has um, tidal pools here along the west coast. And I think this is where I, this marker is, if that's what I think it is, I guess it isn't, but right around here, I think it's going to be further south, there is um, a temperate rainforest. Um, I got caught in lecture for misstating this. I thought the Olympic Peninsula was the wettest area in North America. It turns out it is not. That distinction belongs to, is it Hamilton Lake, Canada? But let's have a quick look here. Olympic National Park rainfall. No, I guess I didn't do that, right? Oh, I just typed rainfall. Yeah, okay, let's look at annual rainfall. 150 inches. Uh, that's a lot of rain. And in fact, um, I'll show you some pictures, but one of the, the biomes that are in here in Olympic National Park is that it's a... Um, uh, temperate rainforest. In fact, that's called the Ho Rainforest. And let's see if we can see where that is. I guess that shows the visitor center. Yeah. So it's right here. And as we'll talk about in an upcoming lecture, I'll probably end up showing you this again. Um, there's a reason that the um, this area receives so much rain, uh, and it has to do with the fact that there are mountains here, and we have a circulation from uh, from west to east, and so this is part of what's this is um, an area where as the the air goes up and gets cooler, it will drop it. it the coolness allows the um, uh, clouds to reach their dew point, which of course causes rain. And so it's part of the phenomenon we see all along these, the westernmost Rocky Mountains, the Sierras and so forth, where uh, uh, rain clouds move in, they increase in altitude here, they rain, and then on the other side, there's very little rain because the, the water's essentially ra already rained off in the mountains. That's called, this area then is called a rain shadow, and it's one of the ways we see how um, topology, in this case elevation, interacts with circulation and helps shape the nature of uh, the physical environment. And because of that, then, you can, as you can well imagine, the plants and animals on this side of the mountains are very different than on this side, largely as a consequence of the availability of rain, availability of water. And we see lots of examples of this. That's the sort of stuff ecology is really about. Um, I'll show you some more illustrations, but before we do that, let's just quickly look at some uh, definitions. And what I really want to do is just emphasize the things we should, that's important for you to, to focus on. I think one of the most important things is this business that ecology is um, uh, the interaction, just the definition I used before, it's the interaction, gosh, if I can spell, Individual, individ, individual with the bio. My goodness. Notice that it, I didn't say species, I didn't say group of organism, it's the individual. And I think that's an important, in fact, that is a very important point. We're, we try to stunt, understand how a discrete individual organism will interact in the environment and from that build broader understandings. Ecology is not environmentalism. Uh, we'll make the point, I'll make, actually I'll make the point in the next lecture, but it's worth emphasizing here. There's a, there's a misconception uh, sometimes about the distinction between um, 
Well, between a basic versus uh, an applied science. Uh, a basic science really just involves the acquisition of knowledge. We don't put any uh, versus an applied science, which of course involves use of knowledge for human purposes, whatever they may be. Um, so I'll give you an, I'll give you an example of this. As we look at the many different areas of ecology, one one arena that always falls under ecology is uh, conservation biology. But conservation biology is an applied science. It uses ecology and our ecological standards as its um, knowledge base, if you will. But the idea and uh, intent to conserve is, um, I guess as I described it, a uh, human purpose and has nothing to do with science. Maybe that's extreme, nothing or only a little to do with science. In other words, it's important to distinguish between things that just have a, a straight scientific basis, which is to say they're part of our, and by our, I mean humans' um, desire to understand how the natural world works. That's very different from uh, wanting to use knowledge towards an end. So um, do I believe in the importance of, of conservation intellectually, emotionally? Sure, but that doesn't make it science. Uh, in fact, it isn't. It, it can't be. So that because um, that intention of using information to achieve some goal is other than just having the information for its own sake, really is at the, the split between basic and applied science. So, so don't get confused when you hear people talk about ecology. It's, it's really common for people to confuse the word ecology or the science of ecology with environmentalism, protecting the environment. Uh, whether or not you think the environment should be protected, in neither case is that ecology. Uh, similarly, even though we'll talk about conservation biology here, just as we'll talk about a variety of other uh, applications of ecology, don't be confused into um, thinking that because we talk about those topics in ecology, they're the same thing as subsets of ecology or whatever. Even if you read, even if you read that, there's a there's a big distinction. It's a distinction, and, excuse me, and it's a distinction I want to emphasize through the course because um, if you fail to make that distinct distinction, it leads to a lot of confusion. One side is is just confusion between what's the nature of an activity, what's the intent in terms of what you're doing. But it's also, um, it's also, I don't, what do I wanna say? I, I started to use the word troubling. I think it's also difficult to um, recognize that how we approach science, how we approach um, understanding for a science is very different than how we approach something um, that uh, has a human intent. And I'll tell you what I think the biggest issue is here, and you'll hear me again emphasize this over and over again. In science, opinion has almost no role, um, by which I, I, and what I mean by that is, we don't judge whether something is true or false based on someone's opinion. Now you could argue, well, yeah, you look at the, there, sure there's an opinion because you look at the accumulation of facts and using that you, you reason out solutions. And so, yeah, from that standpoint, I could say there's an opinion, opinion but it's a temporary thing. Eventually you expect the, the scientific community to move to consensus and scientists will agree, oh yeah, this, this is true or this is false. Um, in contrast, anytime you're using knowledge, you could have an array of opinions and I can't, neither I nor anybody can come along and necessarily say, 
this is the right opinion or this is the wrong opinion because there's an intrinsic subjective nature to it. In the case of ecology, that subjective nature is what's your intent. Um, I think a lot of people who are drawn to studying ecology are interested in conservation. They're interested in maintaining ecosystems. They're worried that by disrupting natural ecosystems, it's going to have uh, very negative consequences on species and, and ultimately on humans. But, but you notice those are all opinions, right? They're not specific to the nature of ecology in term, as a scientific discipline. Well, okay, what else can we say about ecology now that I beat that horse to death? Uh, well, let's look, at, let's look a little bit. Now, one example I used was this business of a single organism in its environment. This starfish in an air tidal pool, and by the way, this is, as I said before, from the Olympic Peninsula, R Rialto Beach, I think it, I think it is, um, is sitting there at low tide as the waters come out. It has to deal with water temperatures, changes in water temperature, and you can consider that when the tide's out in the summer, it's got to get reasonably, it could get reasonably hot there, and in contrast, in the winter, even though uh, being along the seashore temperatures are somewhat moderated by the ocean. Nevertheless, there's this big difference. It's getting buffeted by the tides, what, every six hours, four times a day. So it had to adapt to that. Uh, it has to adapt to not getting banged uh, and, and crushed by these rocks. Plus, it has to find food. It has to deal with other organisms that are here. All of those are challenges for any organism in the environment. Now, one of the things in talking about this individual, it's really common in, bio, in biology for us to refer to um, understanding how a, a species does this or a species does that. Um, hopefully you're aware that this idea of species is not an absolute. Um, there are instances, for example, where I can say I don't know what a species is. Um, it, usually we think of species as being genetically distinct, right? And so that's how we say, oh, well, they interbreed and they have fertile offspring. And that's how we define an in, a species and each species is isolated. Truth to tell, there are at least a dozen different definitions, I think, for species. Actually, they're typically called concepts for idea, the same thing as ideas. And for certain types of organisms, they don't work very well. Um, a good example of this would be oak trees. If you try to define a white oak versus a red oak versus some other sort of oak tree, you're going to be, in terms of genetics, you're going to have the problem that all those things share genetic information. Um, our efforts to try to describe species of bacteria have the same issue. It turns out that bacteria that can be quite un unrelated do have mechanism for, for exchanging genetic material. Um, that's one of the reasons we have this issue with um, the spread of uh, drug resistance from one bacterium to what is otherwise a completely unrelated bacterium. So what I'm, what I, the seed I want to plant here, if you haven't heard this before, is that the notion that a species is a very distinct, um, identifiable, discrete uh, unit isn't true. And as my major advisor used to, it would, would tell me when I was in grad school, if this, given that the species itself is a little bit fuzzy, you can imagine how all of the levels of biological organization above that get fuzzier and fuzzier. So now what Larry Pettigo, my, my advisor, used to say was, well, the species is the only real taxonomic group, but it's not entirely real. And so I mention it here because Part of what we should do in ecology is challenge some of our conventional thinking as we look about how these individual, individual organisms work. This starfish, for example, consists of different tissues, of multiple cells, and within those cells there are mitochondria, there are um, ribosomes, but far enough back we know that mitochondria were free living. So what that says is even at our most fundamental that, that uh, unit of organization, the cell, it's not one thing. It's an amalgam of different things. Just as each cell has a certain degree of independence um, and, and combined to differentiate and form tissues. So I guess what I'm asking you is, is even this individual organism a single thing or is it many things? 
That's part of the questions we ask in ecology. We ask about whether this is one thing or another, and as we look at groups of organisms, populations of the same species, or an interacting group of organisms, uh, a community. Let's take a look at a, a community, a good ex community example. There are in this picture, of course, I think three types, at least three types of uh, kelp. We can see that there's bits of starfish in here. Uh, I don't think you can see them, but I know from walking around this area, there's um, barnacles on here, there's sawfish, and in some place down here, low enough, we can even see some anemones. I think, uh, yeah, look, I've got a picture of that as well. All of these things represent a community. They're, they're bound by time and space together. It's not merely space, because if you think of it, um, in some habitats, we will have species that occur in winter or occur in spring, but not in summer and so forth. But obviously, they're interacting. And the, what are the natures of those interactions? Are they dependent? Are they competing for the same resources? All of those are really compelling sorts of questions ecologists will ask. And as we try to find solutions to those or answers to those questions, hopefully what we're going to get is some sort of principle that we can use to try to help understand other phenomena. Uh, I think I would argue that in ecology, one the most important principle, at least I found it so, and maybe other ecologists would disagree with me, is something called the um, competitive exclusion. It's the notion that two, species, two different species cannot utilize all the same resources. So we've got these anemones and starfish here. They're in the same space. They're at the same time. But the competitive exclusion principle tells us they cannot be feeding on the very same thing. They can't be using everything the same in the habitat because if that were the case, all it would take would be a minor difference in one or the other, a slight advantage, and through evolutionary time, that would lead one, one species to dominate the other through competition. And so a lot of what drives the competitive exclusion principle, the, the logic behind it, is the recognition that as we look closely at, how, at what a, a species requires to live, we discover that very minor differences in efficiency or minor differences in advantage can have huge consequences. And so, I don't know, through, through my research career, for example, I probably have tested um, issues with competitive exclusion maybe four or five times. In other words, I saw species, in this, my case, species of insects who are living in the same habitat, seem to have the same, um, exactly the same properties until we look at them in detail. So, um, and when we do that, maybe I can show you an illustration. I don't know if it's here, but we'll see. Uh, when we do that, we discover that our initial thoughts are not correct. And where we thought they, that these things were exactly using the habitat and the environment in the same way, we discover they are not. And so by knowing that there's this principle that says that um, you don't have two species doing exactly the same thing, when we see something that looks like that, it's a sign that, oh, we should look here because there's actually something more subtle going on. Uh, okay, what else can we say? Uh, oh, geez, I wish I hadn't done that. You know, I was doing that the other day. Okay, so we've got this uh, mule deer. And one of the questions that have really occupied ecologists for a long time is whether is, why do we have one versus two versus three versus any number of different uh, deer? In other words, what are the in the terms of the day, what are the forces that drive populations to increase and decrease? Um, even as recently as, well, I guess it's not recently to you guys, it is to, it seems to me, but uh, like uh, third, let's say 40 years ago. Well, is that when I took ecology? Oh my God, am I old man? Yeah, so even 40 years ago, and let me get out of Photoshop, which is not what I wanted to do, be in in the first place. But when I took ecology, let's say 40 years ago, uh, a lot of my ecology texts and a lot of discussion really focused on issues in what's now called population ecology, that business uh, or population biology or population dynamics, the factors that lead populations to rise and fall. 
it remains an incredibly important topic in ecology because if you think of it, there's lots of phenomena where, and, and lots of issues of human importance where we need to know why populations go up and down. So in this course, we'll, we'll spend some time talking about those things, trying to identify principles where we can. But, um, but what has emerged since all that emphasis on populations are a whole array of other things. Um, we may look at the beha behavioral ecology. Um, in this instance, let's say, talking about behavior of the mule deer. Um, you can note its posture, it's staring at me. That's classic um, behavior from an herbivore um, that's trying to make a decision of stay or flee, right? Um, if we look at this marmot, for instance, uh, we can ask questions not so much about, one of the questions we can ask about marmots, which are often found at, at altitude, what are the factors that keep their populations in check and how have they managed to survive in what is a genuinely hostile environment with relatively limited resources? Um, I think I've got another example of here if I look back from my backpacking history of long ago. I don't know if I did these. I thought I had. Hmm. Oh, oh, it's under the backpacking thing. Sorry. Uh, I thought it was in here. Let's see if we can find the little rascal that illustrates this same point. Uh, there's a, well, okay. There's another marmot. I'll let you look at. Yeah. So that's classic sort of. I think this is. Um, 10,000 feet, if I remember, when we were backpacking in what are called the Collegiate Peaks area of central Colorado. Yeah, kind of hard to believe, right, looking at me now, but I, I used to have a youth. I, I wasn't always a fat old guy. Um, oh, let's see. Here's my cutie. Um, let's look. You know, good, good work, Higley, having all your slides prepared. Gosh. Darn it! Where is that? Oh, you're getting you're getting the array. I don't even know if you can see them because these thumbnails are so small. Uh, I'm just about ready to give up, but I is it this one? Yeah, there we go. I was looking for. I was looking. I have another slide of this. But if you look at these little pikas, they're um, I like to think of as the uh, version of ground squirrels, but they have an incredibly rough life. Uh, I took this picture, I believe, as we were hiking up um, in the mountainside from Mount Harvard, and I, I think this is probably, what's well, just above the tree line, so I think it's maybe 11,000 feet, something like that. They have to spend their summers um, foraging, trying to build up enough material so that they have food for the winter, so they can um, uh, have uh, insulation for their nests. At the same time, they have to avoid a variety of predators. Hawks and eagles are, are uh, um, I would say, pretty common examples. And um, they have a variety of ad adaptations for surviving in what's otherwise a pretty harsh, unpleasant place to be. So I think, I think um, one of the things that appealed to me most about ecology is this ability to try to look at why things are where they are, where they are, and I think that answering how and why questions is something that drew me uh, personally to ecology, and I'm really hoping it's going to entertain. Uh, I shouldn't say entertain, but it should engage your interest in, in excitement. One of the things you can say about ecology, and and I I'm not the only guy who's made this observation, is that when you start learning about nature and you just want to see where are the animals, how do they work, those sorts of things, what used to be called natural history. In a scientific context, that's really what ecology is. And there's hardly any topic in science, uh, in biology, that you can't have an ecological spin on. In my case, a lot of the research I do is called physiological ecology because I'm interested how the physiology of plants and animals help them cope with competition or with surviving a harsh environment. Uh, others. Other uh, ecologists may focus on behavioral ecology, which is the same sort of questions, how do you cope with these environments, but in the context of 
how do behaviors change? There's some other areas I, I want to briefly mention before we finish here, and I thought a good way to do that would, would just pick up this, this game. I'm not going to know if you guys have seen, um, hopefully some of you have seen it. It's available. That's weird. I did that. I think there's a graphics glitch on this. Um, well, maybe not. It looks like it's resolving itself. This is the game Plague Inc. And one of the things that I've noticed that uh, ecology textbooks, sometimes ecology courses, tend not to focus on are some very important phenomena. And I, I want to not make that mistake in this class. One of them is, is, is this game implies disease. If you've not seen Plague Inc., what, really, what the game really does is, it's a game in which you try to help a disease uh, wipe out humanity. And so <clears throat> you do so by having it mutate. You earn uh, DNA points as the disease spreads and so forth, and then you can mutate it. So for example, here I can, I can have the uh, pathogen evolve to uh, be transmitted by mosquitoes. And in this case, uh, we're talking about the disease here is mad cow disease. And we can have it mutate to give different symptoms. We can have abilities such as being hard to rear in a lab and so forth. What does all this have to do with ecology? Well, as a game, it's kind of a simulation of how disease works. I'm not going to say it works all the, way, all the ways that are modeled, but it's certainly true that we do use simulations like this. We try to build computer models to simulate what happens and then allow us to tweak parameters and see if we mirror what's going on uh, in the real world. Um, diseases are one of the examples of phenomena that can be crucially important for plants, animals, in a lot of context. We can, and, and that brings up the other point that as we talk about ecology, we can be talking about uh, not just the ecology of um, animals in the environment, be they starfish, my favorite insects, or what have you, but we also can talk about a variety of other sorts of organisms. And in fact, frequently we find ourselves, or I, I find myself, and I think this is true of most ecologists, referring to um, different groups of organisms, the ecology of different groups of organisms. And that's basically a function of um, recognizing that the forces that shape, let's say, plant distribution are so different than those that shape animal distribution, animal evolution, that it makes sense to talk about plant ecology versus animal ecology. Similarly, we might talk about the ecology of terrestrial animals, which is different in many ways than the ecology of marine animals. Um, Often we don't talk about some areas, disease is one, which is that interplay of uh, microbe with host or uh, pathogen with host, um, in much the same way we could have parasites. Um, there's a whole arena of microbial ecology that tends to be ignored when we initially teach ecology and, and tends to be sh sort of shunted aside for, for those of you who take a micro course. I don't want to have that happen here. I'd like to have a chance to expose you to as much of this as I can. But, but there's a, a core theme that will run through, uh, that should run through this course is helping you understand how systems work and looking for generalities. And um, I think that's a lot of the appeal of ecology. And that's why I think I said this in the very first comments to you. My goal for you in the course is not to regurgitate a bunch of facts or be able to tell me that ecology is based on the Greek word oikos or any of that crap. What I want you to be able to do is synthesize, to take knowledge from different areas and see and, and draw your own conclusions that are scientifically sound. Ecology has this wonderful feature of being an integrative science in that we draw from all other sorts of areas, molecular biology, um, taxonomy, physiology, um, direct observation, behavior, and we use it to try to understand how an organism's interacting. It's, it, it makes a lot of sense that if you're going to do all that, you're going to be thinking about things in terms of evolutionary pressures and selection and so forth. And so I think in a very real way, ecology sort of represents 
the place in biology where everything can come together and you can have understandings that really you would never have if you were not asking questions about an organism and its environment. For me, that's the real appeal of ecology. And I'm hoping as the course progresses, you guys can get as excited as I am about it because um, so much of what we do in science is um, reductionist. We, we try to look for parts, try to look for parts. And, and the danger, of course, in that is that we don't see how those, those tiny parts, our new understanding, fit for the whole, the, the entire system. Ecology is very much about the reverse. And for that reason, I think it provides a really good mechanism, not just for teaching you about the core of ecology, but also teaching us how do we use scientific information? What's the right way to draw on those things? And if I do my job, hopefully that's going to be part of what we, uh, I'm able to bring to you and you're able to take away from this class.